This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, Happy Memorial Day weekend. I just want to personally congratulate you all on your holiness because you are here and it's a three-day weekend. So that means just a testimony to how much you love God. That uh, because you could be hanging at the cabin. Um, That or you don't have a cabin like me. (laughs) So, but we'll go with the holiness one. That's what we'll tell ourselves. Um, Somebody texted me this morning a picture of their cabin they're watching online. So if you're watching online at the 11 o'clock service, I'm not mad at you as your pastor. Just, I might be jealous, but not not mad, you know? So I got to work on the envy in my own heart. But for those of us all here, it's good to see you guys. Anyways, let's actually jump into the series. So we're going to continue into our biblical story series that we've been covering over the last six weeks. And so it began, if you guys remember, with creation. God creates the world. Then it goes to the fall, right? Things go terrible because of sin entering the world. And then we follow the story of redemption, which began in the story of the Old Testament with Israel. It was finally completed in Jesus. And then Jesus sent his disciples through the church to all the world, which is the time that we live now. And finally, we're gonna get into the last part of the biblical story, restoration. And today what we're gonna be looking at is Revelation 21. If you've been around for the last couple of weeks and months, you'll know that we just finished the book of Revelation, which I was trying to think of like something else to preach on, but I was like, there's literally not a better passage on this. And so here we are in Revelation chapter 21. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to what we just read, the first verse. And as you're flipping through, let's pray, yeah? Father, we just thank you for a moment to hear of your true story, and that that might shape all of our lives. And so we just thank you, Lord, and ask that you would just anoint the words coming out of my mouth, Lord, that people might see you, Jesus, clearly. Wherever our hearts are at, Lord, right now, would you meet us? Amen. Amen. All right, for you to understand the end of the biblical story, which we have said is the true story of the world, you need to understand a little bit what it's like to get invited to dinner at my mom's house. Here's what it's like. First, you get an invite, obviously. You show up at my mom's house for dinner. Now, you don't really need to have that much affiliation with me. My mom is incredibly supernaturally hospitable. So if you just mildly know who I am, she would be happy to have you walk in the door. Now, if you come to dinner, the first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna walk in the door and my mom's gonna hug you. Doesn't matter if she doesn't know you. She's gonna hug you. And then before you can say anything, she's gonna walk you into the kitchen. She's gonna hand you a knife and then she's gonna instruct you to start chopping tomatoes for salsa. Whether or not you have any skill in cutting vegetables or cooking whatsoever is completely irrelevant to what my mom is going to assign you to do. When it comes to dinner at my mom's house, everyone participates. You are chopping stuff for the salsa. You're gonna be firing up the grill. It may get a little scary if you've never fired up a grill, but you're still gonna help. You're gonna be cooking the fish for the fish tacos, maybe putting some beans on the stove, helping things out. Everyone is a participant when it comes to making dinner at my mom's house. Now, in the first service, I told that story, and then my wife, whose family is Mexican and makes really good Mexican food, she corrected me and made sure that I let you all know. She's like, I don't think I can remember a time your mom made refried beans. You're making it sound like you come from like a Mexican family. So, so that you don't get confused. This is white people tacos, <laughs> but I grew up with them and I really loved them, okay? Um, I didn't know that there was a higher plane of Mexican food until I got married, Alexi, but that, that's where it is, right? Okay, so regardless, but I had to confess because my wife got after me. So there you go, babe. Um, dinner's a multi-hour process, okay? It began when you walked in the door. There's no point really where you are asking what's for dinner, right? Because you're making it. 
It's very obvious what's for dinner from the moment you walk in the door. So you know what is going to be on the table at the end and you are participating from start to finish. Now, here's why you need to know that story, what it's like to go to my mom's house for dinner. First, because it's one of the most common metaphors in the biblical story when it comes to talking about the end times, is a dinner feast. All the way back in the Old Testament in Isaiah, the image is that God in the end of all things is gonna invite all his people to a feast that he throws and will celebrate that the thing that hovered over all people, death, is gone. And then Jesus picks up that same image and multiple times talks about when it comes to the kingdom of heaven as a banquet feast. And y'all know, because we're all here in Revelation, that when you get to end of Revelation, what's the final image and picture? The bride supper of the lamb, the wedding feast, the dinner party. So that's the first reason that it's helpful to actually get a picture in your mind of what it's like to be at dinner. But here's the other reason why you need to know what it's like to eat dinner at my mom's house. When you are uh, talking about the final chapter of the biblical story, it's unique because it happened, hasn't happened yet, right? Like we live in between. And so there is this mixed experience of eating dinner where you're making dinner, you're trying dinner at my mom's house, but you haven't sat down at the table yet. And so that picture is something that I want to live in your imagination as we begin to ask questions about the final part of the biblical story. What is the future? We already got, it said in that scripture, that God ends everything by saying, behold, I make all things new. The restoration of everything is where the story of the world history is going. But we live in between that time. And so when you begin to look at the final parts of the story of the Bible, when you start to look at that image of the end feast, if you want to figure out what it's going to be like, you can ask some questions. And here's the first question that you can ask. Ready? What's on the table? If you're at my mom's house and you wanted to know what for dinner is, you look at what's on the table. You look at the table that's set that you're about to sit at, and you can see it right there. God, like my mom, is neither hidden nor shy about what's coming for dinner. It's very out in the open. It's very obvious. It's what is coming. It's the restoration, finally, of all creation. So vivid is this picture throughout the Bible again and again and again. It, it, you kind of get the vibe as you're listening to the scriptures that if you were to ask God what's coming, what's on the table, he'd be like, you want to know what's for dinner? I can't wait to tell you. And that's where we pick up in these images in Revelation. So if we just look at these five verses, just zeroing in for just a second to ask what's on the table when it comes to the end of human history, what do we see? Here's the first thing we see. We see that God is preparing a new home. I mean, we love the earth, right? Most of us, we like our experience of being alive. You each got your particular things you really enjoy about the world, but our world's filled with lots of brokenness. Human beings need a new home. What is wrong with this world is that God's space heaven and our space earth are divided by sin. And the vision that is given in Revelation is that heaven is coming down to earth. That God has created what he has set the table when it comes to the final end of human history is the reunification of God's space with ours. And it says that he sees a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven and behold a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. God is going to live with humanity. The first thing that you see when it comes to the picture of what God has for the final time in history is that he's making a new home. A home with no death, no evil, no brokenness, no corruption, 
No more sin pushing back in our work, nor in our hearts, nor in our relationships, nowhere. Why? Because God will live on earth and dwell in a new creation with us. The first thing you see is a new home, but also what is on the table is a new way of life. It says in verse four, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. What is also on the table when God sets it up for the future of our world is that there are no more bouts of depression that put you on the couch for weeks at end. There's no more memorials, no more waking up in the pit in your stomach because your friend or your brother or loved one is gone. There's no more traumatic memories in this new creation. No more chemo, no more sickness, no more hurt, no more pain. It is a world where we live with God and everything that you hate and that hurts is gone like a distant memory. Everything that sin has corrupted has been removed. God has made it so that he says, the former things have passed away. There's just like, we need a whole new category of defining what life looks like in that The final thing that we see is set the table is that we need a new body. Here's what I mean. It talks about right here that there shall be no more mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. It says death shall be no more. What's so vivid in this picture of God's banquet feast and throughout Revelation and in the metaphor that I gave you guys, being together, being in a relationship is beautiful whether it be the relationships of your friends, your spouse, your family. But the thing that is so ugly in our world is that death undoes them. And so what is on the table is that God destroys the only thing that could ever get in the way of the relationship with him for eternity. Death, gone. And this narrative is picked up throughout the entire New Testament that we will give, be given a new body. In fact, Paul says to his letter to the churches in Corinth, this is how he describes it, okay? Just listen. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Hear this. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. I like my body. It's the only one I got but I have constant back pain. I got knee joints that had to be repaired and surgery. And some days I wake up in sickness and my memory's not always that great. And I'm 33, it's getting to just get worse. (laughs) There is a level of our human experience where in the physical body, we know we need something better. We also know it in the fact that despite how much we love Jesus, we constantly are fighting with the own sin in our flesh. And what is on the table of new creation is a new resurrected body for all of God's people. Now, we could go on and on and on about the visions of new creation, but I would invite you just to go back and listen to the Revelation sermon. But rather, I just wanna point out, it's pretty hard to imagine this, right? It's pretty hard to imagine the grandeur and beauty of what God has promised will come in human history. That sometimes it's like impossible to actually imagine and thinking about. I mean, think about it this way. If I asked you just to think about the future, what most often fills your mind? What fills your mental library when it comes to picturing the future? Now, I, I'll ask people, I mean, a lot of you guys know this, if you've ever spent time with me, I ask people to imagine things all the time. 
think imagination is important, it's powerful. And at times I'll ask people, imagine if Jesus was sitting here, what would he say? Or imagine your future in new heavens and earth, what will you be like? And, and at times some of you have responded of like, ah, I'm just, I'm just not good at the whole imagination thing, which is something that I've learned over the years I just don't believe is true. Rather, what so often happens is that our imaginations are filled with something else instead of the biblical story. And what is filled up in our minds drowns out any possibility of our minds being filled with this future feast. And so often I'll hear, I don't have much of an imagination, but I mean, we do. What do you think worry and anxious thoughts are but imagination for the future running rampant? We plan over and over what it will be like when everyone leaves us, when the worst happens, or the things that I have to scramble and race my gears to do to make sure that it doesn't go bad. That is an imagination of the future running rampant, but it's not shaped by the biblical story. The problem is not our imagination. It's that our imagination of the future is not being narrated by the Bible. There are, as we have said a handful of times throughout the sermon series, this is the true story of the world. This. But it doesn't matter. There are so many other counter visions of the world trying to narrate your life over this competing for your imagination and your attention. And you don't need to go looking for them, right? They have already come and found you. You're swimming in them all day long. Counter visions and stories. So in the end, what it says in the scriptures is that God finishes and sets the table, so to speak, as with this word, behold, I am making all things new. But what happens is we end up re-narrating that in a couple of tweaks to that same exact sentence. Here's what I'm talking about. There are three ways that I've kind of thought about of restating this. The first one is, behold, I am making all things new, but it's behold, I am making all things new. This is when our individualism gets like really like distilled down and then it kind of has all kinds of expressions in various forms of politics and identity, whatever. It, it really boils it out down to, if I'm gonna get heaven on earth, I gotta make it happen. And it's up to me. And that turns into a lot of different things, right? I mean, it could be in this kind of triumphalist individualism that is like, I'm gonna do everything I can to make the best life for myself because that's all there is. And so you cut corners, you crawl over other people at work, you grind hard hours, you ignore your family, you take on extra work. I mean, you do everything you can because it's up to you to bring heaven on earth. Behold, I will make all things new. Or you shrink new heavens and new earth into a new home, somewhere better, or a vacation that makes heaven on earth, or in envy as you covet the lives of other people because they have what you think will be new creation right now. This is for me the most common way it gets synced into me. If you just like, for me, I have this ongoing fantasy and this, I'll just tell you what it is. Here's the fantasy, right? It's that my life will finally be complete, fulfilled of the most joy and happiness when I have this version of my life that is not in Arizona heat, especially right now. It's somewhere where it is very green, but doesn't rain too much. And I am somehow simultaneously a farmer, but also live in an area that has plenty of people somehow combining rural and city together at the same time. I'm still kind of a pastor, but I also part-time can be like a ceramics potter, right? And so I combine all these visions of what I imagine would be the best life. And, and then I just kind of have it, I let it kind of sit in the back of my head as this imaginative future vision, that's what it would really be good if the table was set with. And that's just a really fancy way of, of saying, I covet. I sin and envy and covet other people's lives, other people's places, other people's vacations, other people's things. 
The other way you re-narrate, behold, I'm making all things new, is the second one is, behold, I am making all things meh. Behold, I am making all things meh is this kind of like, it's like the result of our culture has no vision for the future. So it collapses everything into your life right here, right now, but it's not really that guaranteed that it's gonna be that good. And so it becomes, behold, I'm making all things meh. And it's, if I could just get by. And so here's how it actually plays itself out. You might believe this one if you avoid thinking about the future at all costs. So much so that you find ways to numb your feelings of futility that you have at work. Maybe you stay up all night entertaining yourself constantly. You mindlessly scroll. You drink, not enough to get drunk, only tipsy. You maybe do other drugs, but it's chill because you got back pain. You look at porn, you find other ways, and there's no limit of concoctions to numb the feeling of being a human and longing for something better. And so you functionally settle for, behold, I am making all things, meh, as long as I can just get by. The final one is, behold, I, behold, all things will be terrible. Now, you believe this if your mind is constantly thinking of the future, not God's future, but the future of despair and terror. And I just level with you. This often begins because something really rough happened to us. Like we have experienced the brokenness of sin. And so wounds and hurts and pains and bad memories and horrible things we accrue over time in our lives. And so then what we begin to take on is this attitude of, it's gonna be bad and I'll just settle in for the bad. And that ends up being our kind of twisted way of protecting ourselves from the risk of trying to have hope. It's pretty scary to live with hope. It's risky. You can kind of collapse everything into, it's all gonna be bad, I know it's bad, and then when it happens to be bad, you're like, see, I knew it would be like this. All of us experience and live into some combination of these. You might try really hard with that triumphalistic, I could do it, and then you fail and it collapses into just numbing it with whatever medication you can find to get by, and then at times it slips into despair, and then at times you go, I'll do better, and you pull on the bootstraps and you, I'll go do it, and then it just becomes a cycle. All of these things, what they have in common is they do not trust God to make all things new. They trust you or some other part of creation, some other vision. Now, I know that the vision that the Bible gives, this table feast meal of a new world where there's literally no brokenness, nothing evil, everything beautiful, is pretty hard to imagine, right? I was talking to somebody who wasn't a Christian this last week about this, and he said, I cannot imagine a future like this because it is so foreign and alien to my experience of life, it's impossible to even believe. And so the conclusion then is it must not be possible or real, but that would be like saying there's no such thing as a fine dining, three-star Michelin rated restaurant because all I've ever eaten is McDonald's. The kingdom of heaven is the final end to the human story. It's hard to imagine because we're used to so bad stuff, but it does not make it any less true. So if that's the predicament we're in, then how do we re-narrate our imagination as it were, right? If what is coming is so good that we're constantly, even as followers of Jesus, we're in risk of not being able to imagine it because it's just so beautiful, then then what? What do we do? Well, that's where the vision of being at dinner at my mom's actually pretty helpful. (laughs) Because you keep that image back in your mind, right? If you wanna know what's for dinner at my mom's house, yes, you can look at the table and see what is being set right there, right? That's what dinner is. 
However, there's another way you can figure out what's coming for dinner at my mom's house. What's on the spoon? If you're like, Jake, what's on the spoon? What are you talking about? So I'm gonna give you a scenario. Um, and in this scenario, I'm gonna ask you a question. You ready for the scenario? Okay, for the three of you that are ready for the scenario. <laughs> the rest of you continue with your nap. Um, if you're at my mom's house and you get invited to dinner and you do all the chopping and the participating, there's gonna be a point at dinner where my mom goes, hey, sweetheart, come here. And she'll pick up a spoon and she'll scoop it into the salsa and she'll say, can you try this? You'll take a bite of the salsa. It'll be delicious. Then, right, you'll, we'll bring in the fish that we just grilled for the tacos and to make sure that it tastes good, little spoonful, here you go, try it, it's delicious, right? Part of why dinner takes so long at my mom's house is that as everyone's cooking, you're like trying things constantly for the like hour and a half that it takes to cook. It'd be so much faster if we just cooked and ate, but that's not the fun, right? We don't wait until dinner time to pour the wine or open the beers. In fact, everybody has already had their first drink. They're trying everything. You're snacking, there's chips and there's salsa and there's salad and every, by the time you sit down at dinner, you have tried pretty much everything that's on the, on the table. So there's a scenario, okay? That's what it's like eating dinner at my mom's house. So let me ask you the question. You ready? Have you eaten dinner yet? A couple of, eh, yes. <laughs> a big, one no. I think it's from John's pastor, it doesn't count. Um, <laughs> You could, answer the, you could answer both ways, kind of, couldn't you, right? You, you haven't eaten dinner. You're waiting for dinner. Your belly's not full. You're hungry. Unless you eat too much chips and salsa. You, you haven't eaten dinner, and yet, so you could say no, you have not eaten dinner, and yet you could say yes, right? You have eaten everything that is on that table already. You don't sit down after prepping chips and salsa and salad and guac and fish tacos. You don't sit down and then suddenly it's like a like takeout pizza. What is on the table is what you have been eating the whole time. So have you had dinner? Yes. And no. At my mom's house, you have this sense of this already not yet. Dinner's already here. You're already eating it. And yet you're still waiting to finally sit down and eat. There is for the kingdom of God, for all of us who follow Jesus, you know what's going to be on the table because of what's on the spoon, what you get a sample, what you get to try. Here's what I mean. Think about, go back through those things that we see in this passage. God creates a new home, right? We are waiting on the new heavens and new earth. I know we don't have that fully. However, think about this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he goes, do you not know that you are God's temple and the spirit dwells in you? And it says in Revelation, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. God already dwells with man on earth. Or did Jesus not promise his disciples when he left, I will not leave you as orphans. I will spend my own spirit to take up residence in you. The new home that is coming where God lives amongst his people, we already get a spoonful to try. This is, I mean, this is honestly, guys, this is one of the ways I became a Christian. I had this experience where, you know, I grew up around some stuff like of the faith, but it never really took story for another time. But here's, here's where it really started to take off in me and I started to go get my attention. Jesus got my attention. I came to this church a couple of times, right? I heard a pastor like me talking and he goes, you, everyone should be in a community group. And I just was like, great, sounds great. So I looked up where a community group was, but I didn't, I didn't let anybody know it was coming because I I didn't, I didn't know how, what the rules were for Christians, right? So rather than emailing anybody, I just found their address. I don't know how I did this. And then I showed up at their house and I went in the side door of the house. So the community group was already happening. And then I walked in like the carport garage door and then people like just kind of look up and they're like, 
because I just walked into a random door. <laughs> and they're all having tea, so I'm like, guess Christians have tea. And, and so I walk in, and they're all having tea, and I'm like, this is so weird. And then we sit down, and I'm all like awkward and uncomfortable, and then they talk about the Bible, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool, Bible stuff. And this, this is what happens, okay? They asked if anybody wants prayer requests and this guy starts confessing his deepest and darkest sins in a room filled with men and women all at the same time. And I was like, oh no. And then everyone in the room turned to him, thanked him for sharing, hugged him and prayed over him. And I was like, who are these people? (laughs) What is wrong with them? In an amazing way. What actually brought me to faith in such a powerful way is I kept hanging out with Christians and I was like, it feels like God's here. Christians, right, us following Jesus, shouldn't surprise us, right? Jesus promised that. They will know you're my disciples by what? How you love one another. What's on the table is the a world where the presence of God dwells amongst human beings what's on the spoon. We get to experience the presence of God even now. This means that the church gets to be a sample taste for the rest of the world. In a world of secular meaninglessness, we're one of the few places in the world where people get to experience the presence of God. What about new life? How do we get to taste that? Death's still here, mourning's still here, crying, sadness, even our own lives, we feel the effects of sin. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I know this is true for a lot of us. You've experienced the very comfort of God in circumstances that if anybody else who wasn't a Christian were watching, should, should rightly conclude, like, you should be undone. And yet somehow the very comfort of God is present. What's on the table is Jesus personally wiping away our tears. And yet we get to experience that even now. What about a new body? Because I said a new body, right? We wait for that resurrection body. That's true. We wait for that, but we also get a taste. Why do you think that we are called to pray for the healing of one another? If not anything else, is that not just asking our Father, can we get a spoonful of what is to come? I think often that's why we just don't really ask for healing in the modern church because we are being re-narrated by another story that says there is no future coming glory. And so we don't even ask, but think about It's just so appropriate for a child to ask their parents before dinner to have a taste. And so we ask and we pray, and I know that we've experienced that in this church. I've experienced it, right? Healing in bodily ways, healing from trauma, things that people have asked God to intervene on and God actually shows up. We get to experience the resurrection life in the present. So, I think often why we don't ask for those things is we are being re-narrated by another story other than the Bible. Now, if we're gonna use this metaphor, which is all throughout the scriptures, that the people of God are a city on a hill, a light to the nations, other ways to describe, you all are meant to be a taste of what is to come. So now... You just gotta like ask in a moment of reflection, if someone outside of the faith were to watch your life right now, what would they be getting a spoonful of? If you're here and you're not a Christian and for some reason you showed up on Memorial Day weekend, which is amazing, I'm impressed. Um, I, I just wanna speak specifically to those who are not Christian in the room right now, okay? 
One of the reasons that I walked away from the faith was that I was around Christians who, in how they lived, in what they said, in what they did, they were the equivalent of somebody at my house not following the recipe, burning the fish, and then offering a spoonful of burnt fish. And I tasted it, and I was like, this tastes bitter. I don't want whatever is coming on that day at dinner table. Now, here's what, I, here's what happened in my own story that kind of fixed that. One, I just figured out what the recipe actually was. How do you do that? You look at Jesus. He is the recipe. And then I got around some people who actually knew how to cook. Like Christians who actually were living out their faith. It wasn't just some like cultural thing because we're Americans, but they lived out following Jesus. And it actually undid some of the damage done. And I was like, oh my gosh, that wasn't fish. That was charcoal. Now I get to experience in the present through the people of God, what is at the table. So if you're not a Christian, just hear my encouragement. Check out the recipe and then find somebody who actually knows how to cook. That being said, right? I, I told people the last, this last uh, service this morning, if you were to look at my life and see what kind of spoonful are you getting, if you're just watching Jake, let's say, in, in all of our life, but pick parenting, right? This last weekend. Depending on the moment and looking at my life and how I parent my son, you are either gonna get, wow, Jake was really gracious and gentle and patient with his son screaming at him, or you're gonna get a psychopath in me watching my life. There are all kinds of ways where we, because of the sin within our own lives and our inability to live out this call, still, even when we love Jesus, fail to be a good spoonful of the kingdom of God. What do we do? You repent, and then you do one of the key things at any dinner feast when it comes to my mom's or the future kingdom of God. If you're at the dinner at my mom's house, there's a moment where she looks around and she goes, okay, serve up everybody. And then everybody fills their plate and my mom fills her own plate and she sits at the table. She is not one of those moms who's like, I made the food. No thanks, sweetie. I'm not going to have any, right? She has filled her glass of wine. She has filled her plate and she has made the table to eat with us. So if you're thinking about the coming vision of the biblical end to the story of all human history, the restoration, the making all things new, the new heavens and the new earth, this feast of what is to come, who's at the table first? Jesus. He is the first at the table. In Colossians, it says, he is the head of the body, the church. Hear this. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead. He is first. We're not gonna do better at being a taste of the kingdom type of people by trying harder. We need to look at the one who sits at the table first, amen? We need to look at Jesus. He is the first, where it all begins. He's where the whole story was leading to. That's what we said at the beginning of the sermon series. You remember how Jesus was in the middle of that storm in a boat and he totally passed out, took a nap with all of his buddies, the disciples, and they woke him up all screaming, we're gonna die. And then Jesus wakes up and he, he rebukes the wind. He just says, be still, be quiet wind. And then the wind stops, right? What is that if not the first moment of creation, obeying God. You remember when Jesus was walking through that crowd and there was that woman who was bleeding for 12 years and she's like, if I could just touch him, if I could just, and she touches his t-shirt and her body is completely healed. What is that if not the first at the table of a new life, of new healing, of a new body? So many miracles Jesus did. But they weren't to prove himself because half of the time he told people, don't tell anyone, shh. Why would he do that? Because his miracles were not to prove to everybody who he was. They were the foretaste of the coming kingdom of God. He is at the table first. He is the beginning of new creation. If you wanna know where the whole story of the world is going, look to Jesus. 
Look to him as he died on the cross and he resurrected from the dead as the firstborn from the dead. He is the beginning, the first to go to the grave, the first to take into his body, the very thing that broke our creation from the beginning, our sin, and he was the first to die, but that was not the end. God rose him from the grave. It was the very victory of God. He was the first to roll away the stone, the first to get up with a resurrected body, the first to wake up on Easter morning on the first day of new creation. And he was the first to say what you one day will say. Listen to me. What you one day will say is what Jesus said first. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You wanna know what's coming at the table? Look to the man who sits at the table first. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your life and for your conquering of the grave and the beginning of new creation that began in you and that begins in every one of us. And so now I pray, Lord, having opened up your word and we heard your scripture, I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in this moment for everybody's, everybody's heart. They might see you, Jesus, and love you. I pray this over everybody in this church, that their imagination would be renewed to see what's at the table and what is coming in new creation. Amen. Let me give you guys a few minutes of silence, a few moments of silence, and in a moment, somebody's gonna come and lead us into our time where we get to respond to the Lord. But in this time, just sit quietly, and as always, ask God to reveal what part, what part do you really need to hear today? and let the rest stay away. So just spend some moments in silence asking the Lord what you needed to hear. Hey church, my name is Brandon. Now we've come to the time in our liturgy where we'll have the opportunity to respond to who God is and what he's done for us. Uh, we're able to do that in four different ways. Uh, first, we give because we serve and worship a generous God who has given us everything in Jesus. Uh, secondly, we sing. Uh, we respond to who God is and what he's done for us. Uh, so we sing, we sing loud, we're formed by the truth of these songs inspired by scripture uh, that we're singing. Uh, thirdly, we come to the table of communion and much like uh, the table that the Lord has set for us uh, in the coming time, uh, when we take communion as Christians, it is a preview and a proclamation of what is to come. That when we take these elements that Jesus broke, he blessed and he gave to his disciples, he gave them to all of us as disciples of Jesus and we're able to experience the presence of Jesus here with us, but also the promise that one day this meal will not be something with bread and wine, but something that all of life will participate in. And then thirdly, like we have throughout uh, always uh, in this series, as well as just our call at the end of every service, as we take communion, as we sing, as we give, uh, it's a call to prayer. Uh, and I just encourage you, we've been praying through these three different uh, spheres of life, our hearts, our relationships, uh, and our work. Uh, if you've been maybe hesitant throughout this series uh, to come and pray, uh, just maybe listening to a voice of shame uh, that would seek to isolate you instead of receiving prayer and loving church community, uh, I would just encourage you today to come pray. Um, if you have been feeling heavy, like this morning I woke up and I felt heavy and my wife and I were praying before I came to church today. Uh, I went, I sat in the service with her in the 9 a.m. and I went and received prayer. So this is not something uh, that is just uh, for the people uh, who are having a immediate crisis. This is 
Prayer is something that sustains and enlivens our relationship with God in all of life in every moment. So uh, as we respond now, uh, let's stand together uh, and we're gonna give, we're gonna sing, we're gonna commune with God through his meal.